This is Rick Rule from Sprott U.S. Holdings. Today I'm delighted to have on the phone Brian London from the Jefferson Companies uh, and my friend Mike Larson from Weiss Publishing. The subject of today's call, or at least most of the subject of today's call, uh, is the fantastic gold newsletter cruise. Uh, if my memory serves me correctly, December 6 through 14, 2019, from Fort, La from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, Florida, pardon me, to San Juan, Puerto Rico. Uh, given that the uh, host of this cruise and the host of several cruises that I have done uh, in past years, Brian London is on the phone with us today. Brian, why don't you uh, give us an overview of what people who attend this can expect? Absolutely, Rick. You know, we do these things every couple of years or so to get everybody together and discuss the gold market. And as you remember, at last summer's cruise that you were, uh, participated in, everybody was getting kind of excited because we thought that gold might be entering a new phase this year. And uh, there was still some doubt in the air, but it, it looked like it was setting up and it was just a matter of when. I think what's changed in the meantime is that we've uh, uh, become very confident that the win is now and that where we are in this new bull market, this new uh, upturned secular bull market for gold is probably akin to where we were in 2001 or 2002, where there are just tremendous opportunities out there just lying in, in front of us that if we pick uh, a few really good ones. We have the potential for some real multi-baggers, um, but as we also have the, the broader market, we also have a tide that's going to lift all boats. So it's a great opportunity to invest. You know, at the cruise last year, we we had some recommendations. It was just a remarkable opportunity to get very uh, 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 close and comfortable with a few select investors and share our views and some of our top picks in the market. Some of those picks, I was just looking at my presentation from that last cruise are up as much as seven or eight times over in price since then. Um, what we see is that by the end of this year, we should be in a confirmed bull trend. And that's gonna be a real opportunity to not just make money on one or two picks, but on the market as a whole and a few really spectacular outperformers. The difference of course now and I know our other guest, Mike Larson, is going to speak to this. The difference now is that we finally have the Federal Reserve on our side, along with all the other central banks in the, uh, in the world. They're moving from a quantitative tightening phase or, or anticipating a move into quantitative tightening to a pause in, uh, in tightening, a pause in raising interest rates. And that's a pause that a lot of people believe is going to turn in the months ahead toward another easing. And, and that would be spectacularly bullish for gold. Uh, Mike, Brian's made some, uh, I think, fairly aggressive claims uh, that we've moved from a period where we're anticipating a gold bull market to the point in time where we are in or about to be in that bull market and presumably a bull market for gold equities. Is that a position that you share? And if so, why or why not? Sure. Well, I always joke that I'm, you know, I'm not a traditional gold bug. I, there's times when I love the yellow metal. There's times when I don't like it. And there's times when I'm not really paying a, a, an incredible amount of attention because I think we're kind of in, stuck in this sideways pattern. But I wholeheartedly agree with Brian's take that we've really transitioned into a much more bullish period for gold. And um, I've definitely been warming up to it for the better part of the last six to nine months. And I think a lot of it goes back to, uh, to this question of why the Fed did what it did. I mean, they laid out this plan, or they have laid out this plan for the last couple of years of slow and steady interest rate hikes, winding down of the balance sheet and all that stuff. And then all of a sudden, uh, you know, you look at what happened at the beginning of 2019, and it's kind of like that, that Watergate style question, you know, what did the Fed know and when did it know it? Um, why all of a sudden did they throw out these carefully crafted plans and essentially do one of the most aggressive policy pivots on, on rate hikes that I've ever seen. I mean, I've been following the Fed closely since the 1990s. And this is a really, uh, a really significant pivot, unwind, change of plans or what have you. And I think it goes back to the Fed being very concerned about the economy as well. I think they should be. I mean, this is a we've had this extreme credit and economic cycle in the U.S. in terms of duration, uh, in terms of the impact we've seen on the stock market, how much it's up in the last 10 years. 
Um, you know, we've seen house prices, we've seen commercial real estate values soaring. We've seen a lot of, of tremendous asset inflation. And, you know, unlike the last couple of cycles where it was first sort of concentrated in tech stocks, then concentrated in housing the last time around, this is almost what, I mean, for lack of a better term, almost an everything bubble, right? Uh, and it's been all these assets that have been inflated by QE and by the, this, this credit boom that we've had. And now the Fed is, is staring, uh, in my opinion, into the abyss and trying to decide what they can do. And they realize there's really almost no way out of this uh, of this this box they put themselves in. So I think, you know, from, from a standpoint for what that means for gold and gold equities, as Brian pointed out, it certainly means that that quantitative tightening that we've been talking about for so long is not going to be the, the the process going forward for the Fed. And on top of that, you've got, in my opinion, uh, the, the allure of gold as chaos insurance. Um, when you, I talk about all these other assets that have been inflated in value, uh, really, if there's one asset class that hasn't been, it's gold and gold equities. And I think a lot of that goes back to falling volatility, uh, a sense that the Fed has this thing under control. And so investors haven't wanted the safety as much as maybe they should have of owning gold as protection against volatility and chaos. And I think that going forward, that's one of the main reasons why I personally like gold here. I think that the as we get into a situation where the credit market is starting to, to have trouble, uh, the economy is kind of slipping towards recession and so on, I think that that's going to be a, a huge trigger for volatility in the market and a big, uh, a big reason why investors are going to be looking for safety in gold. Well, one of the things that I'd like to uh, add is that uh, it's obviously no surprise that a, a guy who works for Sprott and is a large shareholder of Sprott is positively inclined towards gold. Gold has been a, a central product line of ours for many years. But it's worthy to note that just in the last six weeks, we've begun to see inflows uh, across basically every asset class in precious metals that Sprott is involved in, which would sort of suggest that what uh, you are both saying is precisely true. Uh, in addition to the, to the sense that the facts speak to an increasing efficacy of gold investment or gold equity investment, in truth, the money, sh the money flows are just beginning to indicate that the market is paying attention to that fact. <coughs> and what interests me in that circumstance is the upside leverage that we have seen in both gold and gold equities in prior markets. Brian will remember with regards to the New Orleans Investment Conference in the 1998, 1999, 2000 uh, timeframe, when gold couldn't catch a bid. Uh, as it began to catch a bid in 2000, the upside in a metal that nobody cared about was really dramatic. If my memory, memory serves me well, a 10-year run from $260 an ounce to almost $1,900 an ounce. What's always more dramatic, of course, is the response of the gold equities. They usually move a little later than gold, but they move much, much further. Uh, and if we look at how far they have to move, let's just look at the downside that we've experienced in the gold equities. The major gold equities index, I think, was off 60%, but much more dramatically the Toronto Stock Exchange Venture Resource Index was off by almost 90%. It's those incredible down moves that actually uh, give us cause uh, to experience the tremendous upside moves that we enjoy when first gold and then the gold equities moves. I'd like to talk about one other aspect of the cruise, however, before we move on to discussing more about the gold market. And that is the risk that some attendees will face on the cruise. I've experienced this risk firsthand. I can tell you that if you attend the cruise with your spouse uh, attending it because you want to learn more about the gold and gold markets, for all these good reasons, you want to make some money. Uh, the truth is that you and your spouse will likely have so much fun on the cruise, certainly what's happened with my wife Bonnie and I, uh, that your spouse will... Um, force you, literally force you, to take every other cruise opportunity that Brian offers up. Uh, I can tell you this will be my third, and the truth is that Brian's smart enough now not even to send me an invitation. He sends it right straight through to my wife. So if you are interested as a listener in learning more uh, about the precious metals and precious metals equities prices, and if you'd like to do so in very, very, very pleasant surroundings, 
uh, I suggest you pay particular attention. And Brian, I want you to talk before we return to a discussion about gold, to a discussion about what we'll do on the cruise, uh, about the wonderful vessel that will be housing us, and about all of the other reasons to attend. Absolutely, Rick. And as you remembered, the, the first such cruise that I invited you on as a speaker, and then of course invited you and Bonnie on, I guess it was about five years ago or so now, and neither one of you had ever really been on a cruise before. I mean, you were world travelers. You uh, uh, obviously uh, traveled for business and pleasure all over the globe, but you'd never really been cruisers. And I, as I remember, I don't think you'd ever been on, on a cruise. Correct. And you were a bit hesitant about it from all the horror stories you had heard. And I assured you that don't worry about it. Just just come on this boat and you'll you'll enjoy it. And it really is amazing. I don't think you would want to and or should ever go on any other cruise uh, if you ever offered the opportunity because you're totally spoiled by this. It's the Crystal Cruise Line. They call it a six star ranked cruise line. It's been judged the number one mid-size cruise line in the world for about, I think, 20 years straight by Travel and Leisure or some other uh, common uh, industry publication. And it, it's earned all of those platitudes. It's all-inclusive. It's elegant. It's luxurious. The staff is, there's no tipping, yet the staff through their this corporate culture that they've instilled just wants you to be happy. You don't have to ask for anything. You're offered whatever you want. The service is perfect. It's not intrusive, but it's it's ever present. You uh, the only things that you would have to purchase on this cruise are uh, a spa treatment or a bottle of wine over say a hundred dollars. Other than that, whatever you want is always at your beck and call. The inter on board board entertainment is spectacular, as as you know. Uh, every night there's a show, and, and it's it's really world-class, Broadway quality. The ports on this cruise, I chose them uh, personally because uh, the itinerary touches all of the, the, the best spots in the Western Caribbean. Uh, you start off in Fort Lauderdale, but we, we stop in St. Thomas, St. Bart's, St. Lucia, St. Kitts, Tortola, ending up in Saint Juan, San Juan, Puerto Rico, which is very easy to fly out of. So it's, it's just a wonderful event from start to finish. Lots of entertainment, lots of pampering on the cruise itself, wonderful ports. But one of the keys, or the key really, is the ability to mingle with the speakers and the other attendees who by their attendance are kind of self-identifying as very smart, very active, experienced investors in the sector. So the, the strategies, the tips, the insights that you get from our speakers and our fellow attendees over dinner, over social events, um, is just remarkable. I've, had, I've made friends for life from the attendees on this cruise. It's not the kind of thing where you're bustling with people elbow to elbow. Uh, it's just a couple of dozen people that you get to know very well, that are very smart, very experienced, um, and, and essentially, Given the market environment, given the tips you get, the actual picks that you get on this cruise, it's easy to see this event not only paying for itself, but paying for itself many, many times over. It's just a perfect setup given the overall market and the speakers and everything coming, get, coming together with an event that um, uh, just doesn't seem to uh, any, any, there's no doubt that this is going to be one of the most profitable experiences that you've ever had in the investment arena uh, for many reasons. Well, that's great. Uh, hedonistic benefits and financial benefits too. <laughs> Mike, I'm gonna default back to you on the uh, non-hedonistic things. I was particularly <laughs> interested in your second point, uh, given that you're uh, an investment generalist, and that is your discussion that the Fed seems to be very concerned and should be very concerned about the state of, uh, the, state of the economy. Can you talk about that from your point of view as a commentator? Sure. You know, when I look at, at where the markets were and the economy was a, a few years ago, uh, frankly, I was very bullish on, on the outlook for, for the U.S. economy, for U.S. stocks. Um, you know, regardless of whatever listeners, if they like President Trump, dislike him or what have you, 
the policies, whether it tax cuts, deregulation, many of these things that were implemented after the election, uh, we're going to be bullish for equities. And I think that that helped extend the, the economic cycle for, for some time. But really what I've seen in the last year is a market that's been transitioning from uh, this, this clear bull market for, for assets, for stocks that we had from 2009 through, I want to date it about January or February of 2018, to something different. Um, we've seen higher volatility, for example. I mean, wild swings that started last February with that whole uh, VIX explosion. The market was down very, very sharply. We started to recover, and then we had sort of a second round of that turmoil at the tail end of 2018, the worst December since 1931 for stocks followed by this incredible rally in early 2019. Um, again, the market's been transitioning into a very late or end cycle environment where some of the excesses that we've, that we've seen in terms of, uh, of credit behavior, credit markets, lending, borrowing, and so on, the excesses in inve investing, um, all of that is starting to come home to roost. And part of that's because of the past effect of Fed tightening. Part of it's just that, you know, eventually you reach an exhaustion point and what's been noteworthy when I look at the market and how it's been evolving is that leadership has really changed. Those very aggressive offensive sectors of the stock market, your FANG technology names, for example, that got a lot of press, have started to lag. And it's been your more defensive, higher yielding uh, safety type plays, safe money plays, we call them here. Um, it's higher yielding uh, stocks with better Weiss ratings, um, companies that are in defensive sectors like utilities, real estate investment trusts. Uh, again, income over growth type names, that's what's began to lead this market. And I think that that's telling you, um, very similar to what we saw at the beginning of the last two bear markets and stocks, um, those are the types of names, the types of sectors that really started to pick up the performance baton here. And that's what I think is going to be continuing to work for the next 12 to 24 months. So I, I guess if I had to sum it all up for investors, um, it was very easy to just throw a dart at the, you know, at the dart, the proverbial dartboard for, for much of the last few years. Um, but starting in 2018, that environment really has begun to change. So you have to change with that, that, uh, that new cycle. You have to be investing in different types of stocks. Uh, you're selling what you used to be buying. You're buying what you used to be selling. And you also need protection, whether it's, you know, protection against volatility, protection against more, you know, turmoil, like we've seen a couple of times in the last year. Um, you know, gold, I mentioned, is an obvious, uh, an obvious beneficiary of that. But also within your equity portfolio, you just have to be more defensive, carry more cash uh, and, and, you know, be ready to take advantage of opportunities as they come up. Because, again, it's a, it's a definite different environment that we have now than what we got used to for most of the 2009 to 2018 period. And, and I think uh, really it just it just merits a whole new way of thinking and a whole new way of uh, approaching your portfolio if you're going to continue to prosper in this situation. Mike, I hate to believe the point, but I'm going to pick on you one more time. Sure. Uh, very recently uh, in the Berkshire Hathaway letter to shareholders, uh, Warren Buffett took a different point of view. He said about he said, forget about gold, buy the S&P 500. Tell me why you think for the next couple, two or three years, Buffett's wrong. Well, you know, I hate to argue with uh, somebody who, who's clearly built quite a reputation and quite a uh, portfolio for himself over the years. But I think that Warren Buffett, uh, you know, for his style of investing, it's to buy good stocks and hold on to them forever. And he never really wavers from that, uh, that view. And I think that that's all well and good if you're a billionaire, but there's times when you do have to you know, make adjustments to your portfolio um, and, and take advantage of what's going to be outperforming and, and you know, get out of some of the things that are going to be underperforming. Um, you know, and I think that, as you mentioned, you brought up gold as a great example. If you look at the asset, again, if you try and go through a list of assets, whether it's residential real estate, uh, commercial real estate, stocks, all these other sort of esoteric assets, collectibles and artwork and things like that, uh, they've all done very well. But gold has been sort of that one asset class that sort of stuck out like a sore thumb, I think, as a result of a lot of what the Fed was doing and, and as a result of investors being very confident um, that these other, these other uh, paper assets were going to do well for them. But I think that that's beginning to change. It's clearly being noticed in the market. I mean, you look at the performance of gold since the summer of 2018, it's definitely been, uh, been perking up. And I think that that's going to be part of this changing of the guard. The things that were doing very well before, um, you know, just buying and forgetting the S&P 500. Well, that's great if you have an uninterrupted bull market, um, but that's not what we have anymore. That's what began to change uh, in the beginning of 2018. 
and to me, doesn't show any sign of going back to the old ways in 2019 either. So uh, a sort of buy, set it and forget it strategy where you just buy an S&P 500 index fund and you ignore gold, I think that's a, a huge uh, recipe for underperformance over the next couple of years, whereas it may have worked you know, in the, from 2009 through about 2018. Brian, uh, most people here uh, that are listening to this call know you as the uh, host of the spectacular New Orleans Investment Conference, which has gone on for many, many, many years, and of course features all kinds of investments, not just precious metals. Over the course of uh, 30 years, you've hosted a whole bunch of speakers. Tell me something about, uh, without being too flattering to the people on the phone, who you chose for this conference and why, and who is coming that isn't on the call and why that knowledge might be of benefit to investors? Well, on this cruise, we have Marianne and Pamela Aiden joining us as well. And, and I carefully picked this, these speakers. Well, obviously I picked, you, I picked you because of your many talents and able to, uh, your ability to uh, marshal this group into some semblance of uh, <laughs> coherence and get, uh, get the picks out of the, uh, out of the group. Um, Mike, as you said, is a generalist, and what's always intrigued me about Mike is the, that he comes to gold from an entirely different angle. You know, he's not a gold bug. He sees a lot of the same things that you and I and other speakers see, and, uh, and he's come to the same conclusion. I find that somewhat gratifying, but it's also refreshing to see that different point of view and, and get some insights from a generalist that we don't normally get in this kind of a hard money gold bug atmosphere. Uh, Marianne and, and Pam Aiden, as you know, are, are, are old friends of ours for many, many years, but they are technical analysts who have been on the forefront of technical analysis for 30 some odd years and really pioneers in that area. Their track record is unbelievable when you look over that time frame. Uh, they have a very loyal group of subscribers and followers over literally decades who have made an awful lot of money from their advice. They're, they're very soft-spoken, very accurate, and it's just wonderful to get on an, uh, uh, an event like this where you can mingle with people like this and get their insights. Um, so it's a wonderful group of, of speakers. And as I said, we're also going to have a number of attendees here who are going to be just, who are spectacularly successful investors themselves. So you get a lot of insights from them as well. You know, Brian, I think that's a very important point. I remember uh, speaking for you at your conference beginning in the late 80s uh, and marveling about the fact that all of the knowledge in the room was supposed to emanate from the dais uh, out to the attendees, when in fact among the attendees there were, you know, 500 very successful people. The truth is that you're uh, well advised in these situations to listen to everyone because there's a lot of expertise in the room. Which brings up the uh, next point that I'd like to make with you, Brian. Uh, a lot of the gold bugs are uh, making uh, positive noises about the fact that so many central banks around the world are beginning to buy gold. Mm -hmm. What impresses me most, frankly, is the fact that you have the Zells and the Dalios and the Paulsons and the Paul Singers, these self-made billionaires buying gold an audience probably except for a couple of zeros that's not greatly dissimilar to the audience at the New Orleans Investment Conference. Do you have some sense, uh, because this phenomenon, uh, the uh, generalist billionaires coming into the gold space, seems very different than the circumstance that confronted us in, in the year 2000 and 2001, the beginning of the last bull market. Do you, do you have any... Uh, any sort of comment on why uh, we're seeing this shift from these self-made general market billionaires into this sort of defensive gold-centric posture? Buffett excluded, of course. Uh, yeah, because they're smart people. They get in <laughs> on big trends. They get in uh, as secular trends are turning. They have an innate sense of how the markets are shifting. And I, I think they see as... as what I'm seeing in this market, that there, there's a short-term opportunity in gold, but there's a long-term opportunity as well. You know, short-term, we have the Federal Reserve reversing its quantitative tightening or attempt at quantitative tightening. 
the uh, and, and it's reversing because it just can't do it. This market, this whole house of cards was built upon the foundation, such as it were, of quantitative easing. The, uh, the, the wealth effect that Bernanke tried to engender after the 2008 uh, crisis, they wanted to, to pump up the financial markets, the real estate markets, reinflate them to create this wealth effect, which then would lead into consumer spending, then into aggregate demand, which would then lift the economy. But the, the, the Fed's balance sheet and the, the S&P 500 on the way up, the correlation was about 97% on the way up. So when they started to tighten, when they started to remove this liquidity, how did they not think that there wasn't going to be a correlation as well on the way down? And that's what we've seen. And that's why why the Fed has pulled in its horns, has, has stopped its tightening, and as Mike alluded to, is very likely to begin quantitative easing once again. Now, that's the short term. Uh, that's it's in short term over the next few months. That's what I think is going to be a very powerful driver for gold. And I think that's what a lot of these big generalist investors are seeing, this reversal of course with the Federal Reserve and other central banks, that they can't tighten, that the, the only thing that they can do, especially in the face of some uh, signs of, of global uh, economic weakening, they're going to have to revert to printing money once again. Longer term, what we've seen is this this period of tremendous monetary, tremendous liquidity, zero interest rate policies has encouraged governments and corporations to take on a lot of debt, huge amounts of debt. The, the sovereign government, government debts now are at such massive levels that they cannot be addressed without some level of currency depreciation. That's inevitable. And that's the kind of a, a thing that I think is going to come to bear over the next three to five years where we realize that currencies have to be debased to reduce the sizes of this, these massive, towering uh, sovereign debts. Currencies have to be debased to reduce the value of those debts. And when every developed economy is going through the same situation, when every developed economy out there has to debase its currency, they can't debase against each other. They have to devalue against other standards, those being gold, uh, other silver, other tangible asset, assets, other commodities. So I see a broad based resurgence of not just gold and silver, but other commodities. And I think that's kind of the, the kind of thing that these larger, more generalist investors are starting to see. You see a lot of them not just investing in gold, not just recommending the precious metals, but also commodities in general. Mike, Brian just gave an excellent recitation of the case for gold. Many generalist investors would describe gold bugs uh, as the, uh, the little boy who cried wolf too often. <laughs> they would suggest that, uh, as an example, the debt isn't a problem because uh, we owe it to ourselves. Uh, they would suggest that confidence has become decoupled from the bond market because, in fact, we seem to be able to print rather than borrow our way uh, out of difficulty. They point to the fact that we seem to stick handle our way out of the uh, 2008 liquidity crisis just fine. That all that needed to happen is that we had to add liquidity until we solved the solvency problem. What makes it different in your view this time around? Well, I think it's a question of a couple of things. Uh, the first of which would be magnitude. Um, if you go into heading into the 2007, 2009 great financial crisis. Uh, certainly our government had racked up quite a bit of debt in the years prior to that, but that was mostly a household debt issue. Uh, mortgage debt, for example, was where we were seeing all the excesses and so on, and we were seeing the greatest growth. Um, what ended up happening essentially is that is to quote unquote fix that problem, the government took on all of these obligations and debts and put it on Uncle Sam's balance sheet, um, you know, and has left us with debt to GDP ratios that are, that are the highest they've ever been or close to it. Um, it's left us with uh, the greatest nominal amount of debt ever outstanding, um, the greatest multi-year growth in debt that we've ever seen as a country. Um, and most importantly, it wasn't just a U.S. phenomenon, right? Um, this has been happening in many other countries, both in the, the developed and uh, emerging world uh, over the last decade as well. So, you know, if, if it was just a particular part of the U.S. economy where debt was an issue, um, if it was just 
even the U.S. itself that that was having uh, was having such large debt growth, so, so many additional uh, you know long-term liabilities put on the, the government balance sheet and so on. That'd be one thing, but it's certainly not. Um, and that's why I think this is more of a, as Brian pointed out, this is an issue of uh, you know not is the U.S. dollar going to depreciate? It, it's are all or very very many currencies going to depreciate against things like gold because many of these other countries have the same problems that we do. Um, so I think that's a, a major change and a major difference from what we had before. I'd also point out that heading into the last two cycles, there was a lot more theoretically that the Fed could do, whether it was cutting interest rates. Um, there was a lot more fiscal uh, policy action that could be taken because debts and deficits weren't such a big issue. Um, but now we're talking about, you know, trillion dollar deficits, essentially, for as far as the, the, the forecasts go, uh, 22 trillion some odd uh, dollar debt um, load. For the, for the federal government and so on. I mean, the numbers are astronomical. The Fed is now stuck at, you know, not too high above 2%. And they're already talking about potentially this being the end of their interest rate hiking cycle. Whereas in the last two times, you know, rates didn't top out to much higher levels. Uh, all of this to me points to uh, sort of this third cycle, if you will, being the most powerful and most potentially dangerous for the markets that we've seen. Um, it's not just concentrated in one or two assets like in, in previous times. This has been a much broader debt uh, debt crisis, debt in the making, um, a much more aggressive Federal Reserve that's tried all these untested uh, remedies that you know have never been used before on the scale they have been. Uh, and again, they've been joined by the Bank of Japan, the European Central Bank, and, and virtually every other central bank on the planet. So uh, it's this great monetary experiment, the likes of which we've never seen. And I think that it, it would be foolish to just assume that we're going to find our way out of this without there being a lot of turmoil, a lot of surprises, a lot of economic pain. And again, for, for investors looking to protect themselves and hedge themselves against that risk, uh, I think gold's right at the top of the list of things that should do very well in that environment. Well, I, I, would, uh, I, I would certainly concur with every point you've made. You know, one of the things that people need to consider in the context of gold before we talk about gold stocks is that gold has performed very well in almost every currency in the world with the exception of the U.S. dollar. Uh, I read last week that uh, gold is at record highs in 70 currencies worldwide. Uh, and it's interesting to note that gold has done well even in U.S. dollar terms while the U.S. dollar continues to outperform most of those other currencies. If my memory serves me well, uh, the last time that gold and the U.S. dollar performed well simultaneously was, in fact, in 2000-2001. Uh, and that resulted in the dollar at least temporarily rolling over and gold doing extraordinarily well. Uh, I'd like to agree with a few of your other points, too. It's interesting when you talk about debt and deficits that both debt and deficits are uh, problematic at the corporate level, with share buybacks, at the federal government level, which is, of course, what most people focus on, but also at state and local government levels. The on-balance sheet liabilities, which you talk about, went through $23 trillion. It's interesting when I talk, $22 trillion, I'm sorry. It's interesting when I talk about this at various groups that people's eyes glaze over <laughs> because they don't know what a trillion is. Uh, it seems the fact that it's 12 zeros uh, makes it somewhat, somewhat less problematic because it's difficult to understand. But that number, the $22 trillion, is really dwarfed by the off-balance sheet liabilities. Those people who are watching this video are looking at an off-balance sheet liability. I'm 66 years of age. I qualify for Social Security, Medicare, uh, Medicaid. Uh, all of those of you who are young, thank you for the tremendous transfer payments from your poor self to my old rich self. Uh, the truth is, uh, across the country, as I understand it from the Congressional Budget Office, the net present value of off-balance sheet liabilities at the federal level is about 140 trillion U.S. dollars, added back to that 22 trillion dollars in on-balance sheet liabilities. And of course, uh, at the federal level, we seem to be adding to that number uh, by a trillion dollars a year. That is the deficit. What I see happening in the world uh, is a, a complacency that has to do with liquidity in the system. 
When the system is liquid, when there's cash in the system, people seem to be less concerned about whether or not the system is ultimately solvent. It's sort of like a, a, a person who has uh, 60 or $70,000 a year in income and has a million dollar mortgage. If they have $10,000 in their jeans, it means they can you know, service a couple months interest and buy a dinner out. But it doesn't mean that they're solvent. And my own suspicion is that many generalist investors are confusing liquidity, the fact that there's cash in the system, ultimately with solvency. My suspicion is when arithmetic begins to prevail over narrative, people will become nervous indeed, and gold will, in that point, uh, in, that point in time, uh, truly, truly prosper. Now, I'd like to uh, shift gears in the little amount of time we have left. One of the things that amuses me uh, in terms of presenting to small groups, like the kind that we're going to encounter on this cruise, is the opportunity to give practical rather than general advice. One of the things that I like doing now, and the crowd seem to like hearing about it, is talking about what I'm doing with my own money now. And one of the things that I look forward to on this cruise is talking about five or six uh, very timely investment decisions. Uh, might be about bullion, might be about mining companies, that I am buying at that time and defending my thesis. And of course, I look forward to challenges to my thesis, uh, both from the crowd and from other speakers. Uh, Mike and Brian, perhaps you could talk about something, uh, some things that you're hoping to teach on the cruise, some ways that you'll benefit the people on the cruise directly. Uh, well, one of the things that I like to tell people is, is that when they invest in in gold at crucial points like this, you can probably, or you're counting on gold going up significantly, whether that's 20%, whether that's 200%, or whether it was like that 2001 time frame when we saw gold go up uh, seven times over from those early stages around $250 an ounce. What you're going to see is the gold stocks leverage those gains. It's going, they're going to do much better than gold. And what you're going to see is that the junior sector is going to do much better than, say, the seniors when you get further down the food chain. What we enjoyed in that period from about 2001 through 2008 and even through 2011, we, enjoyed, we saw companies, these juniors, go up three, four, five times in value. And sometimes you would get a 10 or 20 bagger. And investors would take those gains. And that's an important part of what we're going to, to go over with the, with the uh, attendees is when to take gains and how to take gains along the way. But when investors would take gains off of a, a, a five bagger or a 10 bagger, then they, they would roll those back into other stocks that would go up three to four times. Some of those, again, 10 or 20 baggers. And then they would roll those gains back into other stocks that would go up similarly. The numbers just compounded in silly ways. There were absolute fortunes made during that run in the junior mining sector. Now, when you get to the start of a big move like that, which is where we think we are right now, we've got the Fed reversing course. We've got other central banks not even being able to start their quantitative tightening. We're going to have the, some form of easing at some point in the, uh, the, the near term to intermediate term. And we're going to launch off of that into another one of these big secular moves in gold and mining stocks. It's another opportunity to get in early and start those kinds of gains rolling. So timing's a big part of it, but there's an inevitability that you touched on with the debt and everything else that it's hard for anyone to look at this Look at gold at this environment. You see that near-term opportunity. You see that over the next year or two, some of the companies you're going to get into. You know, a company I recommended, again, just on our cruise last summer is up six, seven times in value already. There are going to be more of these kinds of opportunities. But it, behind it all, in the background, there is this long-term issue of debt by not just the U.S. by not just uh, the the, uh, the Federal Reserve creating that kind of liquidity in those issues, but not just in the U.S. but around the world. Every developed economy has just tremendous debt loads, so all of these currencies are going to have to be debased over the long term, and that's the kind of a backdrop. That's the kind of a 
of uh, tailwind that we're going to have in these investments for really over the next five to 10 years. Mike, same question for you. Can you talk uh, specifically about sort of what lessons you propose to teach uh, and sure. how the people present might benefit? I think for me, uh, the biggest story, the biggest message that, that I'm going to try and, and drive home, and I think incredibly important, is just where we are in, the, in the, that cycle. I mean, again, I, as a monetar uh, monetary sort of a generalist who approaches the market, I, you know, I think where you are in that, that Fed easing versus tightening cycle, whether you're in the sort of uh, up cycle for credit or down cycle for credit and so on, those types of factors are, are, are a huge uh, part of sort of my decision in terms of what things I want to recommend, what kinds of investments I want to be involved with, and what kinds of investments I frankly want to stay the heck away from. And I think that, you know, all of those those cyclical factors, uh, the same kinds of things that that helped ignite that the move off of gold, you know, in the early 2000s, or the move for gold in the early 2000s, um, there, those types of things are with us again now. Um, that point in the, the monetary cycle is a huge tailwind for you as an investor in metals. Um, I think that the increase uh, in volatility, the increase of uncertainty, the, uh, now as we go from sort of the benefit period for all these experimental policies in terms of what they meant for the economy and the stock market, and we get into the, hmm, maybe some of these things are going to come back and bite us phase, that's going to be huge for metals. So I think that it what I'll try and do is give all the uh, of all the reasons, all the data that tells me this is going to be a very large, significant turn, uh, and these are the ways that you're going to prosper in that environment as an investor. That's my most important message. Remiss uh, in this uh, call uh, about gold and gold investing, not to mention two other opportunities that take place before the cruise. Uh, one would be, of course, the Sprott Vancouver Natural Resources Investment Symposium in late July in Vancouver, British Columbia. And the other would be the occasion that caused all of the speakers to meet each other, the venerable New Orleans Investment Conference taking place, if my memory serves me well, uh, around Halloween time in New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, people who are uh, Sprott clients uh, and part of the Sprott universe We'll hear about the Sprott Vancouver Natural Resources Investment Conference, of course. It's a conference that goes back to its founding by Agora and takes place, as I say, every summer in Vancouver, British Columbia, uh, a center for mineral exploration finance. Uh, and Brian, I, I know you don't require too much urging to give a little plug for the New Orleans Conference, but why don't you go ahead and take my invitation? Hi. I surely will. It's in New Orleans, of course. It's a fun place to visit. but. There's a, uh, it is the granddaddy of all investment conferences, kind of really started that whole industry. And it has a reputation for bringing in big name speakers from around the world in every asset class. It's a reputation that Jim Blanchard started with a open checkbook to, to get uh, the biggest names out there to come to New Orleans. And therefore I kind of inherited that tradition and <laughs> have to write those checks now myself. Uh, it's a blessing and a curse. It's a curse for me. It's a blessing for the attendees because they get views, they get speakers they won't see at other events. And again, the, the attendees at this event, they've traveled to New Orleans, they're spending four days just soaking in a lot of uh, insights and investment intelligence they won't get elsewhere. Really smart people and in mingling with those attendees is, is one of the highlights and the greatest benefits that, that we can give to, uh, to our attendees. Mm -hmm. uh, as you said, it is uh, around Halloween time this year, November 1st through the 4th, and we have some exciting speakers that we're lining up right now. In addition to you two gentlemen, uh, we're going to have dozens upon dozens of speakers in every asset class with a particular emphasis on precious metals and mining stocks but some on economics and philosophy and, and, um, and uh, other, as I say, other a asset classes. Uh, I'm on the verge, I'm biting my tongue. We have a couple of big names that we have not yet been able to lock in. So I'm not going to mention them. I'm not gonna promise them until I'm absolutely sure they're going to be there. But uh, this is gonna be a, a really big event for us, our 45th anniversary. So it, it's gonna be a whole lot of fun and, uh, and it, very rewarding once again. Well, suffice it to say that uh, viewers of this video 
uh, have a lot of opportunities to learn about precious metals and precious metals investing in the balance of this year. And all three speakers on this video believe that the opportunities are at this point in time particularly enticing. There will be links at the end of this video associated with the Sprott Vancouver Natural Resources Investment Symposium, the New Orleans Investment Conference, and of course this gold newsletter cruise. Gentlemen, thank you for participating. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed the video and found it useful, and I look forward to seeing many of you in Vancouver, in New Orleans, and of course in this spectacular cruise. Thank you all and goodbye.